<laughs> yeah, you're trying to get rid of me. Um, I, I tried my best, Mark. So. Yeah. We, we were the second smallest group. I have had plenty of things to say, but there's never any shortage. Um, we actually shared the room here with Murray, and it was quite interesting because uh, I noticed that Murray was unable to come to consensus with himself over several <laughs> points, um, which uh, I, I, you know, just as a comment. Um, uh, so our group was uh, Betty Graham, uh, Pearl O'Rourke, uh, Laura Rodriguez, and myself, um, and uh, we ended up uh, talking about, I think, some overarching issues that have come up uh, uh, across many of these projects, um, and I'll just go through these very briefly. Um, one that came up quite a bit yesterday was IRB-related issues and the fact that there's a high amount of variability between how our institutional IRBs approach these types of projects. And so the idea is, would there be the potential to develop um, some general gui guidelines to review, perhaps a points to consider or FAQ, best practices um, that could be disseminated? Um, there was a fair amount of um, uh, pessimism that we can uh, engage with OHRP to actually have them issue a guidance uh, about uh, some of these issues that we're coming up with. Um, but w there's also perhaps the opportunity to do some discovery, and so we were thinking about the idea of um, uh, taking information um, uh, that had been uh, collected from a survey that Wiley Burke had done and, and had been recently published, uh, and to use this as the basis of a tool that could be um, uh, distrib distributed to uh, members of the genomic medicine group, to investigators and also to the group's uh, institutional IRBs, uh, to try and answer some questions, which is, uh, can we understand why IRBs are giving different answers for the same project? Um, and if, if we can identify some of those areas, is there a way that uh, NHGRI or other entities could um, uh, provide some guidance or fill that gap? Now, this is something that turns out has been sort of on Laura's to-do list uh, for a while, and so she volunteered to take uh, leadership of this, uh, and so uh, there will be more to come. The second issue that uh, came up uh, frequently was the idea of the clinical research interface. You know, what is clinical care? What is discovery research? There are blurring of these issues, and there were several um, sort of case studies or examples that we came up. Um, some of it uh, related to logistics and electronic medical records that in some places uh, research results are contained within the same data warehouse as clinical results, and while there's attempts to firewall uh, research results. In some cases, when you have a clinical investigator, they have actually access uh, to some of these research results, which can lead to mixing of research and clinical data. Uh, probably not the best way to, uh, to do that. Um, this is not new with electronic health records. It, that can certainly uh, and has happened with paper. Uh, it's just probably the energy barriers are lower. Um, so this was, uh, the, the example that was given was an oncology clinical trial where genetic testing was done as part of a trial uh, for discovery and that somehow those test results were then available in the electronic health record, even though we'd had no idea what to do with them. Um, uh, HIPAA treats family information differently than OHRP. Um, there was an example from, given from the Virginia Twin Study where OHRP issued um, a uh, uh, guidance or, or um, uh, said if you have an identified subject and then you identify a relative of that identified subject, so, so the mother of an identified subject, that that subject is uh, by definition identified and is a potential research subject that uh, may be, uh, or is a research subject that may be subject to consent. And while we've talked about it uh, to some degree in a hypothetical situation, the reality is our clinical laboratory colleagues deal with this daily, uh, trying to make an assignment of whether something is pathologic or benign or, or uncertain. Uh, and um, uh, there have been, uh, this came up more at our previous meeting last week, that there are issues relating to when does that cross the line into research, and at least one clinical laboratory has a uh, uh, IRB-approved protocol that allows them to do um, uh, family contact uh, to look at whether variants are de novo or, or uh, uh, familial uh, and to get additional uh, phenotypic information. Um, the return of research results that are actionable uh, that we discussed today and the blurring of the term consent 
Uh, so we give consent to receive clinical care, uh, but in some cases the consent to receive clinical care also indicates um, uh, information provided to say we're going to be using residual specimens uh, for research or other purposes. Um, and so um, uh, there is a, a, some uh, blurring in that area as well. Um, there is the potential to do, um, uh, to, uh, do, do discovery around these uh, questions of blurring. Uh, there may also be the opportunity to do evaluation or inventorying of different approaches. What are we all doing uh, to deal with these issues? And also to study consequences uh, of this blurring. And this just by chance happens to be the subject of the panel that's going to follow my talk. So uh, we'll have plenty of opportunity to discuss that. Um, Variants for clinical use, uh, different groups are making recommendations about what's ready for prime time. Uh, we've heard about those. Uh, for the most part, uh, with a few notable exceptions, uh, these decisions are being made in a siloed basis or they're institution specific. Um, would it be possible to develop uh, criteria that we, we could agree on that would allow us to evaluate um, uh, the uh, clinical implementation uh, of variants, and if so, how could we facilitate the consensus building uh, around this? Is that a role that this group could uh, fulfill? Um, this was also an issue that came up in the uh, previous meeting, and so uh, one of the proposals that we would have would be to uh, create a work group that would be a subset of uh, members from this group and, a me and membership from the previous meeting uh, to address these issues uh, since they're re relevant to both. Um, we've heard about uh, implementation science um, and uh, the while we have a lot of uh, varying expertise in the room, we don't have a lot of expertise uh, related to people that are actually the implementation scientists that are studying uh, implementation. So the idea, could we create a, a group of consultants uh, for systems, uh, members of this group that are looking to implement something, so this would be implementation scientists, quality uh, experts, uh, to help with some of the uh, issues that need to be considered in terms of how do we actually successfully implement something. I mentioned yesterday the um, um, liaison uh, with the dissemination implementation uh, group uh, through NIH, of which we have some representatives here, David Chambers, who we'll be hearing from shortly. Um, so that may be a possible uh, opportunity to um, uh, enhance our knowledge around those areas. Uh, developing a suite of validated methodologies to collect data out of the clinical setting, to answer clinical and research questions, to complete that dynamic loop so that when we put something out into clinical practice, we can actually collect the data uh, to show that this really is having an impact, an example being what we talked about earlier with Murray's project that if we can show that we're canceling fewer surgeries, that that could be a signal to administrators that would say, hey, there's something uh, important about this genomic medicine and maybe we should be looking for more opportunities to take advantage of it. Um, we also probably need to understand more from our colleagues that we're going to be imposing this on about what their experience has been uh, with the genomics. This was a very enriching uh, uh, for us uh, when we were looking at family history implementation to actually find out what it is uh, they were doing, how they were um, experiencing. We've, we just don't often ask them, what are you actually doing with this and, and, and what do you think about it? And we learned some things that uh, we really didn't uh, suspect going in and had we uh, gone forward on our preconceived notions, uh, we would have not had as successful an implementation in a couple of different areas. So those are ideas that, uh, that we kicked around that where there would be the possibility for uh, collaboration uh, and, or uh, perhaps more importantly, incorporation of these concepts into some of the other projects that are more specific to some of the content areas that went previously. I'll take questions. I have a question. No. <laughs> but will you be able to come to consensus with yourself? I'm of two minds of that. <laughs> Mark, I, I think uh, the idea of aligning the rules for uh, sharing family information, both family history and uh, genetic information, is critical right now. Because of the state of Massachusetts law, the lawyers and partners have actually discussed 
not allowing some of the practitioners who care for a patient to see the genetic results on the patient they're caring for. So I, it's, um, it, it's a long step to when, I, when I'm going to be saying that I want to know what the, the mother and father's uh, mm -hmm. genetic results are to care for the patient. But uh, that may be a local issue in part, but the, the broader issue of, mm -hmm. of really defining when you can share medical records uh, amongst family members is really going to be important, I think. Yeah. And, and I know Jeff's laundry list is pretty long for the family history group, but maybe this is something that could be potentially incorporated in that as well. <laughs> When you, when you had the, the issue of making group decisions about variants, and we heard about that with BRCA1, BRCA2 as recently as yesterday, but uh, to my left is someone who, leading the CPIC activity, has brought a peer group together, and they are, for all the pharmacogenes, mm -hmm. are one by one going through them. Mm -hmm. And there are some things that are obvious slam dunks, but there are other things that are not such slam dunks. And I think this is an example, the BRCA1 example is one, this is another one, and Mary, you're too modest to say something, but how has that gone? Because it, those are models that I think you, right. you're implying we should be applying. Well, and I, I would nuance that just slightly in the sense that um, it's perhaps less so, I think that the decisions about implementation are always going to be local decisions, I mean, because it's always going to be the local people who are going to decide, is this for our system ready for prime time or for not? I think what we're, I, we were talking more about was a consensus around the necessary information or criteria to at least, you know, make the decision. And, and CPIC is, is one of the examples of a consortium that's coming together, although I think um, it's a consortium of like-minded folk uh, and, and, so in some, and in some sense advocates. Um, and so, uh, you know, that could be at least subject to someone saying, well, geez, you know, these are all people that just want to do this, and so are, are they really being objective in terms of their criteria? But it's at least a model of, of people that are trying to move this forward. Yeah, I agree. And we have as a goal to, and uh, we always did, after we do the first few examples, what were those things that made us consider this mm -hmm. a slam dunk? Right. And we haven't had to delve down into the examples of gene drug pairs yet where there's a lot of disagreement. And a perfect example of that is CYP2D6 and tamoxifen. So there are some very strong advocates and there are some people that are really against that. When we come to those controversial issues, then we're, if we're gonna have our hands forced to really say what are the criteria to advocate uh, for implementation of this, this, and that variant. Yeah. So we, we haven't really been pressed to make those difficult decisions yet. But I guess our feeling was you start with the things that are non-controversial, right. then you figure out why you thought they were non-controversial. Right. And I, and I think that's a, a, exactly what we want to do. And if we take you know, the process that CPIC is using plus the process that many of us are using when we're making these decisions, and we uh, gather the information together about, okay, how did we come to the idea that this was controversial and non-controversial? We should be able to identify some common themes which I think could lead to some standardization around a methodology. The other thing I would point out is that controversy in this context is a really good thing because that's going to set out your discovery projects, which is to say, okay, half of you think, you know, the tamoxifen uh, thing is good, half of you don't. Let's develop a research agenda uh, to answer the specific questions that we have concerns about. Because a lot of times what we find is the studies that are being done aren't answering the questions. And I think if there's one thing that I can point to for EGAP uh, that has been very useful is that even though the, the majority of the recommendations have said not enough evidence, what they've done in their recommendation statements is to say, this is precisely the kind of evidence that we need to actually answer the clinical question. Um, and and, it, and we'll have to take that in, into account, you know, how much of it is actually pragmatic enough to be able to be captured. But at least you have a chance then to direct people to try and answer the question that is important as opposed to answering other questions that might otherwise not be useful. So, Mark, the um, five clinical action, um, uh, five se clinical sequencing UO1s that were just funded all have the aims to return either exomic or genomic results to their subjects, and so they would be good partners in a mm -hmm. clinical action uh, group think 
Good. And, and uh, eMERGE uh, e obviously also has a subgroup that's working on, uh, you know, how do we make decisions about this. So there are a number of groups in the space, but as usual, you know, they're all sort of, uh, the, the crosstalk is not necessarily being facilitated, and I think that that's something that this group could potentially do. Um, so again, I mean, I, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I want to go back to really having this done in a very systematic way. So when we do this for BRSA 1 and 2, it's really based on prior probabilities so that you have something that's deleterious with a prior probability of 99 to 1, something that's suspected has a prior probability of 95 to 99 to 1, and that there are different <laughs> levels of evidence, and it's been determined how you weight those levels of evidence. And so I really think that this is an area and Karis can also chime in, uh, where we really thought about this a lot. Um, I think that I was talking to Mary about what the levels of, what the types of evidence that you have to use. We've seen functional studies be wrong. They aren't weighted that strongly. Con conservation is weighted depending on how far it goes in the species. You weight co-segregation. You weight things in trans. You weight LOH. There are lots of levels of evidence that are used to move these together. You do modeling of people who have deleterious mutations in large sample sets versus people who have an UCV, uh, view, or depends on VUS, and you look at it. There's lots of ways to approach this, and certainly in the BRCA1 and 2 field, there are a lot of people who thought a lot uh, very hard about how to do this and to really be very rigorous about how you move things b between different categories. And I get a little nervous about this conversation when it's sort of we think it's good or we think it's bad. It really has to be done in a very rigorous, thoughtful fashion. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that, uh, although I think we're talking about two different things. Um, there are things that I think um, we clearly uh, have uh, rigorous evidence about where um, we can look at implementation uh, where it's a, really a very different question than arguing about the level of evidence or the binning. There are discovering things that are going to be much farther down the pipeline, and we need to account for both of those ends of things. But I think we also have to be pragmatic, which is, um, uh, you know, the, the current output of EGAP to just pick on one systematic uh, synthesis of evidence is one variant a year. Um, that's not going to cut it. And so we have to figure out ways to do this um, uh, in, in, in a systematic way um, and, and do it rapidly and then be willing to learn uh, quickly uh, whether this is having an impact or not. And this is, uh, you know, this is an issue that we deal with in, 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 in medical practice all the time. Uh, there's uh, almost never certainty about what we do uh, in medical practice, but we have to be able to uh, put it into an environment where we can actually define and capture outcomes to say, do we make the right choice or did we not make the right choice? So there's, there's compromises in terms of how we're going to, uh, to do it, and um, we need approaches that are not only systematic but are also, also scalable. So, so I'm going to follow Mark's admonition to be practical and suggest that we break now. Lunch is ready. If everybody will just grab their lunch in the next 15 minutes or so, and then we'll start uh, Pearl's uh, session at 1230.